I spend my life looking at the dirt. I mean, I'm really looking at the end of a good field day. It's in my hair, it's in my pockets, it's on my nails, it's smeared across all my field notes. I don't think it's a proper field notebook until it's got mud and at least one squash fly in it. And it's a real job as well, apparently. I am a soil scientist. It might not be one of those things that five-year-olds say they dream of being when they grow up. It's not very glamorous. And I do think I'm here in spite of school lessons rather than because of them. What is the website for? I still don't know. Okay. Uh, we sat in these very sterile laboratory come classrooms when I was at school. They opened the year I started. Um, but it did mean that they were, you know, very, very shiny, very new. We weren't really trusted to touch anything. And uh, we had a very ancient teacher who stuck to doing worksheets and occasional demonstrations at the front of class. I think barely aware they had an audience. And we just sort of giggled and wrote things on each other's pencil cases. But I wish just once we'd had a lesson on biodiversity, on the million species that have filled every niche on this wondrous planet, on how a single photon of light travels all the way across the solar system from the sun to meet a tiny sea plankton so perfectly that it can make sugar. And then the plankton is eaten by a jellyfish and the jellyfish gets eaten by a sea turtle. And all the while the plankton are still there and there's so many trillions that they release half the world's oxygen and they release enough matter and sulfates that they help to create clouds which then make it rain thousands of miles away. We could have learned how the monarch butterfly migrates 3,000 miles across the world or how the purple emperor butterfly feasts on rotting flesh. We are surrounded by such wonders like this. Kids love science we all start with a fascination about life in the world, but I think school does tend to head this off early. Our excitement gets distilled through chloroplast labelling or tattered textbooks until science as a basis of our everyday lives is disguised from us and it becomes some sort of dull backroom irrelevance. Just like those sterile do not touch classrooms of my childhood it becomes something that's far removed from us and then the bell rings and you just go home. When really, science is the rainbow and why music sounds beautiful and why you can stream Australian cat videos in the time it takes you to walk to the fridge. You, without thinking about it, discover and learn and do science every day of your life. Life is science. If you've ever tried a new recipe or made compost, you've done science. So if sea turtles are so awesome and plankton make clouds and the internet now spans beyond the boundary of earth, why would I devote my life to soil? Because I cannot understand how we know more about the surface of the moon than we do about what's beneath our own feet or how there can possibly be more life in a teaspoon of soil than there are human beings on the entire planet. Soil digests, it moves, it even breathes, it is alive, and it influences everything else around us. And at the same time, it can be influenced by. So the actions of one farmer, one plough, each tiny little action, or even a microbe, <laughs> us, you know, working together can have this huge ripple effect on the world around them until they're enough together to change the weather, or feed a nation, or change a law. And this is therefore a very literal and personal translation of the butterfly effect. You may realise now I love nature, that is my kind of science, uh, and I especially love butterflies. When I was 17, I already knew conservation was what I wanted to do, so I did a self-directed A-level study on British endangered species, and then I stumbled across a butterfly called the marsh fritillary. It's one of the most endangered species in the UK, and in my opinion, one of the most beautiful. If you've only seen sort of peacocks and meadow browns and cabbage whites, it can be hard to imagine how such tiny wings can hold such intricacies of their pattern and how each minuscule scale can reflect the light to make so many colours play across your fleeting vision of them. When I was 20, I got my dream job. The best job I've ever had. I was a surveyor for the Wildlife Trust. And my job was surveying plants that grow on bogs and moors and corn grassland, which is a very rare type of wet grassland. 
acidated rivers for invertebrates. So I'd, the well is on, my net in hand, and I'd go and collect these little trays of fantastic mini beasts like caddis fly larvae that build tiny little homes for themselves out of fragments of shell and stones. Uh, I prowled hedgerows through the night with a bat detector, learning to distinguish the different kind of calls that the different species of bats make. But most of all, I was there to search for a particular kind of butterfly, the marsh fritillary. Never, when I first learned about them when I was 17, did I dream I'd ever see even one of them, never mind 70 of them in a single afternoon, as they were fluttering right through my fingertips, doing this gentle dance through a beautiful wildflower meadow that was full of summer haze and sunlight dappled through the trees that screened this little paradise from the rest of the world. I found these butterflies on the edges of little sheltered copses in the moorland, on in meadows, on tiny patches of scrubland. And then as the pollen and the heat and the hay scent of summer fade into this beautiful burnished autumn, came the caterpillars. The mother marsh rotillaries weave what looked like thick cobweb into a quite rare plant called devil's bit scapius. So they lay their eggs in there and then the dark, jet black, spiky, quite distinctive caterpillars emerge into this sheltered world where they're protected from the eyes of predatory birds and they eat their way through the scabious leaves and then emerge in all of their beautiful colours next summer. Now you're probably wondering why a soil scientist has this obsession with a butterfly and not, you know, like soil. But to get to the butterfly you need devil's bit scabious. And what do you need to get devil's bit scab scabious is what we thought maybe the right soil. The wildlife trust were a bit stuck because they seemed to have tried everything else. It wasn't about aspect or shade or shelter. It wasn't really even about land management because we were finding these butterflies on farms and moors and even gardens sometimes. So what could it be? And how were we gonna bring this beautiful butterfly back from the brink of extinction? One of my colleagues was nursing hundreds of devil's bit scabious seedlings in her greenhouse, just waiting for the right time, the right place to go and plant them where they would hopefully flourish enough to tempt in the marsh fritillaries from other sites. If we could bring Devil's Bit Scabious to a whole new site, a central linked area between lots of different existing populations, it could be a refuge, it could be a corridor, it certainly would be a place where nice healthy gene transfer could take place because when populations become too genetically similar to each other, they fall into a lot of different traps. It would mean that one bad winter in the west of the county wouldn't exterminate half the butterflies left in the entire UK. So my colleagues and I set about taking soil samples from every field we could possibly find any devil's bit scabious and comparing it to where soil samples where we didn't find any scabious at all. So we learned to sort of rub and roll and smudge the soil between our fingertips to tell what texture it was. We sniffed the soil and we learned to tell what clay and loam smell like and what a soil rich in organic matter smells like. We covered every available surface in our office with these homemade foil trays full of very carefully documented soils, which could admittedly be a bit of a nuisance if anyone wanted to make a cup of tea or get to the microwave, but everyone was very nice about it. And we allowed all of these soil samples to air dry so then we could take them to the university to analyse them. For me, that was quite intimidating because I'd never done what I thought of as real science, which is the mixing chemicals and conical flasks and lab coats sort of science. So I'd assumed that what we did wasn't real science. <laughs> but that bridge of going to the lab showed us actually we did science every day. We were discovering something new, something about how the world worked and trying to make things better. So we mixed chemicals and we made solutions and we did titrations and all of this stuff that had become this terrifying alien concept since we left school. And we found nothing at all there were no links between soil pH or how dense it was or its water content or its nutrient content with anywhere the devil's bit scabious chose to grow. No common facts at all. But that's science. <laughs> Finding no link is important. It means there's more questions to ask. It means there's something else we haven't thought of yet. It's exciting. And I think that's why people become scientists is a sort of pure childlike curiosity about the world. <laughs> so what did happen to the Devil's Bit Scabious seedlings? 
but with no better ideas and time running out for the season, we just planted them all on this lovely central nature reserve uh, and hope for the best. Hope for that Field of Dreams misquote, build it and they will come. And they did come. Since I worked there, nine new marsh fertility populations have been established. And that amazing summer now means I'm back in the lab now, specifically as a soil scientist. I discovered that science didn't mean scary and smart and out of my league. It meant something for everyone who was curious enough to ask questions. I learned that soil meant far more than just the dirt that gets under your nails after you weed the garden. How important, just a little bit, how important it was to everything else around us. It made me want to find out more. And it made me realise that one type of soil may or may not save a whole species of butterfly from extinction. And now here I am, I'm still learning about soil every day. I've learned about how it stores three times more carbon than the atmosphere and how we've lost 133 billion tonnes of carbon out of the soil to the airs and the rivers and the, the oceans since humans started doing this little thing called agriculture. I'm learning how soil is one important jigsaw piece in this puzzle that we have to solve to save our planet from this devastating two degree temperature rise. I've learned about how microbes glue the soil together, how roots create space for air and water, how soil compresses over time, and that natural stabilising process can mean carbon gets buried underground for decades. I want to help solve the challenges we face, so I'm trying to help do that now by trying to find out how farmers can store more carbon in the soils, which not only makes our food grow better, but might help suck some of that carbon out of the air. And all of this is science and it's soil. You all got here today driving on soil, thriving on soil. And this is the story of how a butterfly might change the world. Thank you.